Uh, my name is Bere Bliesemann de Guevara. I'll be chairing today's session. And as Juliet already said, it's about a book that has just come out with uh, Bristol University Press called Fieldwork in Areas of International Intervention, a Guide to Research in Violent and Closed Contexts. And what we're going to do over the next um, roughly hour and a half um, of time that we have is I'll briefly introduce um, today's speakers, um, which are four authors in the book and two discussants. Um, I'll then give a very short introduction into what this book actually is about and also a bit about what it isn't about. Um, and then I'll hand over to our speakers and they will have between five and seven minutes each to um, share some kind of uh, interesting insight, some message, some argument with us, something they would like uh, us to think about. And then we will open the virtual floor. There are now 78 participants on this. I think there are over 140 uh, registered for this. I've never moderated something like this, so we'll see how it goes. So bear with me as I try to find my way through this. So to the introductions, as I said, my name is Barrett. I'm at Aberystwyth with the university and I'm here because I'm one of the editors uh, of this book. And I'm actually also one uh, of the subjects that's being studied in one of the chapters in the book. And then we have uh, Morten Boas. Morten works at the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, NUPI, and he is the uh, other editor of this book. And he has also written a chapter, and this chapter is called Unequal Research Relationships in Highly Insecure Places of Fear, Funds, and Friendship. And he reflects on his research in the Sahel. We then have with us John Heathershaw. John is at Exeter University. And he is one of the editors of the book series in which this book um, was published. And the series is called Spaces of Peace, Security and Development. And it's actually the first book in the series. So it's not just a book launch, but also actually a series launch. Um, and John has co-authored a chapter on the politics and ethics of field work in post-conflict environments, the dilemmas of a vocational approach. And um, the research that is being reflected on took place in Tajikistan. Then we have Daniela Lai. Um, Daniela is currently at London South Bank University. She has, as I've seen on Twitter yesterday, just published a book on uh, socioeconomic justice. Um, and she has a chapter in this uh, field workbook on a different form of intervention, revisiting the role of researchers in post-war contexts. And her observations are taken from her research in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, then we have Katarina Kusic. Katarina is based at Aberystwyth University, and she's actually the editor of another recently published book on fieldwork, which I can really also recommend. It's called Fieldwork as Failure, which is published with EIR, and you can find it online um, for free, actually. And her chapter is called Interpretation by Proxy, Interpretive Fieldwork with Local Associates in Areas of Restricted Research Access, and it's about a project in Myanmar. And then we uh, have two discussants with us today who will offer kind of their thoughts uh, on field work. Um, the first one is Kasha Kaczmarska. Kasha is based at Edinburgh. The second discussant is Catherine Owen. Catherine is at Exeter. And um, they are not just here because they kindly agreed to say something, uh, but also because they are seasoned field workers in places such as China and Russia. Now, before I hand over to all these speakers, let me briefly just say what the fieldwork book is about, or maybe let me start by saying what it's not about. So if you're looking for a book that tells you something else about specific research methods, which interview uh, method best to take for which type of research design, this is not your book. It's also not your book if you're looking for something that tells you whether to do qualitative or quantitative or mixed method research or how to design um, your fieldwork best. Again, it's not your book. And although there's the word guide in the title, um, it won't deliver an answer to the all you ever wanted to know about fieldwork question. And this is not because we were lazy or because we didn't try it, but because what the book is actually about is about all these kind of challenges and dilemmas that you meet when you do uh, research, uh, fieldwork based research, especially in contexts that are violent or that are illiberal. And this is no matter how experienced you are or how uh, well prepared you are. So this uh, is bound um, to happen. So what the authors in the book do is they actually take a step back from the research they've done and they take the time to reflect um, on, on these challenges, on these sometimes dilemmas, so kind of challenges that don't really have a good, good answer. Um, and, and they talk about that. And they talk about that in a quite honest and also quite self-critical way. 
and they reflect um, what can be learned from these um, uh, these experiences. So it's also not about adventure or hero stories, but really about people who were prepare, prepared when they went into the field and still kind of uh, encountered um, different challenges there. Um, we are, uh, so over half of the um, authors in the book are actually uh, women. We have authors at different career stages from PhD researchers to people who've been in the business for several decades. Um, some are from outside the countries that are being studied in their research. Some are from, from those countries. Um, and we have pro projects from basically all world regions except for uh, uh, the Americas um, in the book. Um, so it's quite a, a big um, array of things. The book is um, organized into four large topics to which the chapters speak. And these topics are control and confusion, security and risk, distance and closeness, and sex and sensitivity. Um, so you can get an idea of what the kind of themes are. What all the contributions have in common, I would say, is really this kind of people taking the time to reflect on mistakes, on dilemmas, on challenges, uh, and, and to do that in a, in, a, in a very open way. Now, a last word before I hand over about the awkwardness of talking about field work in times of a global pandemic. I don't know what your lockdown situation is in Wales. We are very much still at home and can't do much. There are no shops open um, or anything. Um, I think it's, it's, it is an awkward time to talk about field work, but at the same time, it's probably also just an opportunity to really do what the authors have done, namely to step back and think about kind of past experiences, about future plans, um, about what is necessary in terms of field work, so what do we actually have to do, maybe also a um, view of kind of global environmental um, concerns, but also what is, what is not possible to do online. There's a lot of talk about going, doing like uh, uh, virtual kind of uh, digital ethnographies now and so on. And I would claim, without having spoken to the authors, that none of the researchers that are discussed in the book would have been possible without the human interaction of actually going into the field and doing the field work, despite um, all the, the difficulties of doing this in a liberal or, or violent context. So it's really also an opportunity to look forward to when traveling will be uh, possible again. So I stop here and would like to hand over. So we go in the, actually in the, in the, um, in the order of the uh, speakers as the chapters show up in the book. And I would like to hand over to Morten Boas first, um, who is in the section Control and Confusion. Morten, report to us about your confusions in field work. Uh, certainly, Berit. Um, I hope everybody can hear me uh, OK. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up, Berit? Great. And uh, thanks to BISA for uh, allowing us to have this uh, online. Uh, I mean, I don't have uh, that much experience with this online stuff, but we'll see how this goes. Um, I want to just step back uh, very, very briefly to say that, I mean, uh, this book is sort of an outcome of a very long conversation between me and Berit about the sheer fact that while there are plenty of methods books where from which you can, uh, people can read and learn the technique, there, is, there was and still is very few books who talks about what is probably the much more difficult thing about field work because I mean, a qualitative, uh, qualitative interviews, at least you can learn the technique. I mean, for doing a survey, I mean, you can learn the technique. I mean, it's about, uh, uh, how to sort of uh, identify the population you are interested in, how to draw samples, these kind of things. I mean, these are things that you can read about. These are things you can learn. They are basically, in my point of view, techniques. And some of them are uh, pretty difficult to master. So I'm not just saying uh, that to downplay the importance of uh, paying attention to it, not at all. But still, I mean, there is astonishingly little that has been written, at least more, and uh, very few systematic attempts at trying to sort of reflect more systematically and critically about the whole fieldwork process and not the least the failures that everybody make and i think there has been a sort of common silencing 
in the disciplines that do fieldwork, anthropology included, although probably some anthropologists would uh, react quite strongly to that uh, statement, but I, I still would stick to my gun, that uh, there has been a re reluctance and a silencing of the failures that we make, because we do make uh, failures. We are not these kind of machines that just uh, jump into another uh, environment, also an environment uh, which may be highly insecure and just go about doing our uh, job without having second thoughts about things. We are confused. We feel that uh, sometimes that we lose control. And when we feel that we lose control, I mean, we may get angry, we may get sad. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. There is also emotions uh, attached to this, and uh, we should discuss them. And we should discuss these things in an, in an open and frank manner. And none of us, and particularly those of us who are more established in the field, should be much more forthcoming concerning the mistakes that we have made. I, I realized that for a younger uh, researcher, I mean, just about to embark on either a PhD or just finish the PhD, being on the job market, say, uh, sort of coming out in honestly, uh, honestly saying that, well, I mean, I may have produced a great thesis, but oh my God, I did a lot of mistakes on the way and I stepped on people's uh, toes. Uh, there may be people left in the field who was very angry with me. Uh, all these kind of things. I mean, I realize that it may be difficult to say this. So I think it's uh, it's a responsibility particularly, but not exclusively, of those that, of us that are well established in the field to lead this conversation and try to lead it with a sense of honesty and frankness and willingness also to really scrutinize what we ourselves have been doing in the field and our own emotions and what, uh, what has happened and what has not happened and so on and so forth. So basically, this is what, I, what I'm trying to do in this chapter, uh, <clears throat> which is an attempt by myself to reflect quite critically about what I have been doing in the Sahel and Mali, particularly, but not exclusively in Mali, because I also worked uh, elsewhere in, in the Sahel, Niger included. What I've been doing there for the since I started working there, which was basically around 2007, and then with a much more sort of sustained engagement with this part of the world after the crisis really hit the world attention in 2012 with the crisis of Mali, which has just continued un uh, unabated ever since. And I've tried to sort of organize this around the lines of fair funding and friendship. Why these uh, four uh, Fs? I mean, it could have been uh, others, but we have to admit it that I don't believe people I don't believe colleagues, I don't believe friends who tell me that they, uh, they work in immensely insecure places like the Sahel, like Liberia and Sierra Leone during the civil wars in Nigeria or in the uh, Eastern DR Congo and, tell, and they tell me that they have never felt at least even a tiny bit of fear while being there. I simply don't believe it. Because I mean, we are human beings and I mean, all of us, have also, if you have an attachment to nothing else, we have an attachment to ourselves, I would say. So, I mean, we are not suicide pilots. Uh, so, I mean, and fear is uh, one of the most sort of common uh, human emotions that uh, exist. And we should think about that. I mean, how, how, do, how does the issue of feeling fear also affect how you work in the field? Because all of us will be confronted with this. And we need to think about it. How does the, the, this uh, affect me, but also how does it affect those I work with? So that's the fair thing. The funding thing comes in because, at least for people like me who, uh, who work as a project funded researcher, meaning that, that uh, I work with a place where I work, NUP is a project funded institute. So we work on projects that we need to get funded. That means that when we work with, uh, with uh, our partners and colleagues, and some of them have also become friends in places like Mali and Niger, I mean, yes, both of us 
both me and others from Nupi or elsewhere uh, in the global north. We depend on them, but they also depend on, uh, on us, meaning that whether you like it or not, and how much we talk about sort of mutality, common interests, uh, that we do this together, co-production and so on, which I think uh, me and others have been quite, uh, have become increasingly good at doing this kind of, having this kind of co-production idea about the research. Yes, I see you. It still is a very unequal relationship because we are the ones that control the funding most of the time, 99% of the time, and we also spend most of it. And this also has, and I'll end in 30 seconds, this also have a huge effect on the relationship about how we think about friendship, how we think about collegiality, but also, and here's some of the, the big sort of last warning signals that I would have, that we need to become much better. And in the, cha in the chapter, I have a, a lay out the story about how I completely misread a situation, did not understand that somebody was willing to do something because that person wanted to have my attention. Because I re represented not only funding opportunities, but also an opportunity to connect to the global world of international acad uh, academia, publication, and these kind of things. And my failure to see this, my failure to acknowledge this, put both me, but also this person, into a quite a dangerous situation that luckily we got out of, but I should have seen this much earlier. And it's only because I was too preoccupied with my own research agenda and what this could lead to with regard to publication that I sort of pushed those concerns aside. That was certainly not something I should have done, but I'm also very much certain that I'm not the only one that has done this. I know a lot of other examples of this, and we need to start talking about them and not silencing them. And this is what this chapter and this book is all about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Morten. Uh, I would like hand, to hand over to John Heathershaw then. Uh, John's co-author chapter is in the section Security and Risk. I think John is going to share some fancy slide with us. Over to you, John. Thanks, Barrett. Yeah, I'm going to share a slide, um, but it's not fancy. It's a simple text slide. I can't share it at the moment. I think Bella needs to give me permission. Um, but uh, I'll press on whilst, whilst we do that. Um, so my chapter in the book is co-authored with Padaviz Molojonov, uh, who is a Tajik national, and we were working in Tajikistan. I think both of us really appreciate the fact that this book is very practical. It's quite real in that sense. It allows us to talk about mistakes and things that didn't go so well. And in this project, they certainly were a number of things that didn't go so well. And they had at least, well, a number actually of fairly significant consequences. So I, I'm, I'm totally on board with what Barrett and Morton have said about that. And I think that's a real strength of the book. Okay, I can share now, I think. Well, there we go. So I think you should be able to see uh, just the simple PowerPoint slide that I put up there. It's really just so you can follow what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so our experience was in Tajikistan, and it was an experience as a foreign scholar and a national scholar. Um, it was an ESRC-funded project which ran from 2012 to 2016 on conflict management. And it was framed in what we hoped were quite positive terms in looking at the effectiveness of state and non-state actors to, to manage minor armed conflicts. Uh, but as I mentioned, we, we did run into trouble, and we faced, particularly faced in our partnerships, differential risk. And this is something that Parviz and I had faced since 2007. We've been working together on off. And uh, we had sort of, I think, some mechanisms. We talked about that. It wasn't something we were unaware of. But clearly the threats, the direct threats to him in country were greater because of the fact of his citizenship compared to mine. We were also working with our colleague, Alexander Sadikov, who particularly felt the sharp end when we did get into trouble. So I'll just very briefly outline that story. It got quite a bit of media attention at the time. So some of you, I know some of you on this call are certainly aware of it. But Alex and I were at that point conducting fieldwork together, 
part of these was in the country as well, but not at that present moment working on the project. Uh, he and I did some interviews in the capital city and um, then for various reasons, which I'll come on to, we split up and Alex went off to a disputed region where there'd been some political violence, the region of Gorno Badakhshan. And on his first interview there with a political party lead, leader, um, a figure who was um, legal, he didn't have a criminal record, but unbeknownst to us, was being investigated at the time by the security services. Whilst conducting that interview, he was arrested by the security services, detained and um, charged uh, with very serious um, offences um, of sort of the terrorism and espionage type, which carried a, a minimum jail sentence of 20 years. Um, so very acute moment, very rapidly uh, went to a very serious uh, incident. Um, ultimately, um, a number of academics, including myself, were involved in a campaign for his freedom and he was released 36 days later and then a month or two after that allowed to leave the country. Um, that's all discussed in the book for those who want more detail on that and also in a quite a number of news items. Um, so it was quite clear from this experience that fieldwork is unavoidably political. And it's not just political because um, as Jesse Driscoll, who's on this call, I think, um, this chapter in the book talks about, you know, as field workers in Tajikistan, and I think in many places, you are seen as being spies. Um, so that's partly because of the nature of the regime type of the state. Uh, but I think also because of the fact that it is a place of intervention. And the intervention is also in a way occurring in the research. We were intervening in that environment, just as the international agencies and actors were, were intervening. Um, we were crossing borders and um, that made a, a transnational connection between us as researchers, which we saw as benign, but which wasn't always seen as such by, um, by the, uh, by the, well, it wasn't at all seen as such by the authorities. So that was our experience. Our logic was to shift, as it says there, from a procedural to a vocational approach. So what do we mean by that? Um, what we call a procedural approach is the approach taken by research ethics committees and institutional review boards in the United States, where there is what's called a robust standardized procedure in place, which as a field worker, you're supposed to follow around issues such as consent, um, permissions, anonymity, uh, and, and all these sorts of things. And the idea there, in the textbook at least, is to put these rules into practice. That's actually been hugely criticized in the wider literature um, on, on field work in, in the last five to 10 years. And, and even to some extent, I think IRBs in, and research ethics committees have been dismissed as being detrimental and damaging to field work. And there's some truth to that. In response, we take a vocational approach where we see research ethics as a set of judgments made by, or sorry, we take, uh, there is a vocational approach, I think, which many people take, where judgments are made by professional researchers in a working and living environment where ethical issues extend far beyond these formal regulations. Now, in terms of thinking about the procedural versus vocational approach, I don't think it's necessarily a matter of either or, but thinking about the relationship between research ethics on paper in an ethics committee application and research ethics in practice. Uh, the procedural approach supposes that that explanation is harmonious, that procedure uh, just is put into practice. A vocational approach recognizes that very often ethics in practice are in tension with ethics on paper. Uh, there can be conflict even, and sometimes indeed, as the critical literature suggests, uh, the procedures that are supposedly best practice uh, can make things worse. So we argue that fieldwork must be primarily voca vocational. Uh, procedures are necessary because they provide institutional support when things go wrong and we receive that in this case and insurance cover which can be very very important. And I think they're also important in that they make sure that the university which has approved and houses the research, often a wealthy foreign university like, like my own University of Exeter, actually take some responsibility for what happens institutionally. But nevertheless, you cannot reduce ethics to these procedures. You must move to this vocational approach. 
And what we do in the paper then is pick out five dilemmas. I'm just going to spend, I hope, no more than a minute on each that we faced. Um, and we elaborate these in the chapter in light of our experience in Tajikistan, particularly the 2014 incident involving Alex. Can, um, you, so spend first, a minute, can you spend a minute on them together? Try, I'll try and do that, Barrett. Yeah, sure. Um, so firstly, safety. Uh, this is why I've got the slides, so I knew I'd better get through them. Safety in the dilemma whether to conduct research at all. Um, so here you could say do no harm versus see no evil, but do no harm versus do no research would be um, would be one. Travel advisories often work against research. Um, in this case, the situation was rather confused. What was more helpful was local advice, particularly from local academic contacts, and that was more helpful but even that didn't protect us. Secondly, positionality and the trade-off between access and impartiality. So do we try and get close to our sources or do we try and protect them by going through other ways of accessing the field? So we actually got um, our invitation letters from the British Embassy and we approached the government in that way through the British Embassy, trying to build partnerships with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and a local university again, for various reasons that didn't work. And one of the ways, reasons was, which was the third dilemma, which is that of permission. So uh, we got a tacit official approval. We were given visas on the basis of what we were doing, but that also invited official surveillance from a different part of the state, from the security services who were in many ways, and well, very much were much more powerful than the parts of the state that we were we had gained approval from and it was them ultimately that sought to bring the case against us. Fourthly, consent, overt versus covert approaches. There's quite a, a big debate about this in the literature, I think. Um, some people favoring covert approaches. I think that's an acute one in field work. Um, we certainly were more overt than covert. Uh, we were quite upfront about what we were doing, but it didn't protect us from the charge of, of espionage. But I think there is an issue here about signed consent forms being carried around, something which is often recommended by research ethics committees, being something that gets your past participants in danger. And so you know, some areas which blend overt and covert approaches. Um, so, you know, oral consent maybe as opposed to written consent can be quite important. And a fifth and final area is that of collaboration. So one of the issues of working together as a team of a national and foreign researcher is that you want to do meaningful co-production with uh, authorship and research design even shared across the national and international team. But at the same time, one of the means of insulating oneself from the worst consequences if you're a local researcher working with a foreign scholar is to have sensible distancing, sensible distancing where you can have plausible deniability and you can actually present yourself as far less important in the project than you may in fact be. So there's a lot of debate, I think, about the use and abuse of local research assistants, and that's a really valid debate, and I've seen lots of evidence of that. I may have at times come close to uh, doing that myself. I, I hope not, but I think at times um, I, I certainly may have done. But there's another side of that, which is that, um, if you are a nationally based scholar to, 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 to be able to maintain yourself, your positionality is being on the side of the state against the foreign academic coming in is quite important too. So there's lots of really complicated dilemmas. As I say, I think they need a uh, vocational approach and lots to discuss there, but I'll stop now because I know I've gone over time. So thanks, Bert, for yeah, your thank understanding. Thank you very much, John, for these uh, really important insights. Um, I would, like, I would like to move on to the book section, Distance and Closeness. And our first speaker there is Daniela Lai. Um, and then Daniela will actually pick up on something that John said in the beginning, namely that we researchers also do some sort of intervention. Daniela, over to you. Thank you, Berit, and thank you to you and Martin for, uh, for having my chapter in the book. Um, and so, yes, I'm going to say a few words about my chapter, and uh, uh, which, as Berit said, uh, fits the theme of distance and closeness and this has a lot to do with the relations um, that exist in the field and where researchers are positioned in these in this setting um, so in the chapter I discuss specifically 
this question of how research itself and the presence of researchers themselves can constitute a form of international intervention that is very often, um, especially by local participants associated with the work of international organizations. Um, so for me, reflecting on doing fieldwork in an intervention context didn't just mean thinking about how, for example, I was uh, researching the supposed targets of these international intervention or the uh, officials that were involved in uh, carrying out this intervention, but also acknowledging that my presence there as a researcher coming from um, a, a, an English university and also uh, someone who is not from the country and region I was studying, um, that my presence was part of a, a broader international research intervention into, um, into that context, which was um, uh, Bosnia. So this was when I was doing fieldwork uh, during my PhD and the reflections in the chapters are based on that. So I noticed how this presence of uh, many international in researchers over the years has produced a very clear distinguishable effects uh, on the field. Um, and I will focus on, on two things. So one that has to do more with the, with the sort of closeness uh, and one with, with distance. So uh, as I, I, I imagine some of uh, you who do research in other areas of the world have noticed there is, especially among some circles of professionalized uh, NGOs and civil society society sector. Um, uh, some post-war countries have developed this kind of research fatigue due to their sheer number of uh, research interviews they've been asked to carry out over the years. Um, and what, what I found was that my some of the participants I interviewed in Sarajevo specifically, which was not the main uh, site of my research, but I also was talking to them, um, was that there was a, a sort of, they felt a hyperproduction of research uh, that they did not find helpful because they very often didn't see the results of this research and they felt there were exploitative dynamics in the relationship with researchers who of, uh, uh, to whom they were giving up their time for free and the researchers were not giving anything back and getting professional benefits out of this relationship. Um, but what was more interesting for me was also to note how this was producing some changes or renegotiation in the relationship between researchers and participants from these local organizations. So you could see how they were, they told me uh, how they were rejecting um, many interview requests, many more compared to the past. Uh, they were becoming selective in uh, uh, accepting interview requests, uh, uh, focusing on projects that were more developed or that had um, contacts with local, uh, pre-existing contacts with local organizations. Um, and also they were more explicitly asking for something in return, uh, which could be just uh, for example, uh, asking researchers to share the research product at the end or uh, to do something more practical that was of help to the organization. Um, and so the second, the second point I discuss in the, in the chapter has instead to do with, uh, with distance and with the fact that quite paradoxically, even in a country that is perceived by many now to be over-researched, like Bosnia, there are still some areas, groups, or, or even topics that remain outside of, the, um, of our research agendas and that remain dramatically under-researched um, under and not very well understood and not part of a production of our kind of academic knowledge. Um, and this is, what I say in the chapter is that I, I, um, I relate this also to, uh, our presence as researchers, especially from IR um, in the field where in a field where the, uh, our research questions and research agen agendas are very much shaped by the presence of these international organizations and the international community there. So if international officials and international organizations are mostly based in the capital uh, and some realities outside of the capital cities are kind of removed from their concerns and everyday life even, uh, this will be mirrored in the academic production of knowledge about these places and countries. Um, and so, so as a result, these places remain kind of marginal and distant from, uh, from us as well. And so that is another way in which 
the uh, our presence as researchers in intervention context can be uh, uh, considered to be uh, or perceived to be by local participants a form of international intervention or assimilated to the international intervention. So I, I just want to draw two main points of kind of conclusion or reflection on this. The first one would be that when uh, I remember definitely when I uh, was learning about methods and doing fieldwork in uh, and research ethics especially, we are normally trained to think that participants in post-war countries are because they are in a post-war country is vulnerable and that our relationship with them has to be kind of seen through these lenses of vulnerability. And while I think that is extremely important, it's also a very unidimensional way of understanding this relationship. And that it would have been a lot more helpful for me to, before leaving for fieldwork, to reflect on the risks of this kind of exploitative dynamics and research fatigue that I encountered and that I was not you know, fully prepared to deal with when I, when I encountered them. Um, and the second point has to do with reflecting a little bit more about um, on our position as researchers going into the field. So in my case, I knew that I was going to be doing um, research both with local communities uh, and with uh, people working for international organizations. And the way my research question was uh, framed and phrased and the research topic presented, uh, I think it was uh, more reflecting the point of view of uh, of uh, the experiences of the conflict as lived through some of these uh, by some of these communities um, and uh, and the way we frame questions also situates us in the field so they may be perceived as either close to the agenda of international organizations and the work of international organizations and therefore a little bit detached from the concerns of in, uh, local communities or it might be the other way around that if the question and the and the research uh, topic is framed in a different way that doesn't match the international community's agenda and priorities, then it becomes more difficult for us uh, uh, to communicate uh, uh, about our research uh, to these international organizations, which in many cases are uh, at least a part of our interlocutors. Um, and again, I wish I had thought about this more before, uh, before starting my research. Um, and my field work. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't know how I'm doing with time, but I was very brief, but I can stop here. Yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Spot on with time. Thank you so much uh, for these insights and these thoughts. Um, we stay with the uh, topic of distance and closeness and I would like to hand over to Katarina Kusic. Um, Katarina, are you there? Yeah, hi. Uh, so first of all, thank you to the editors for uh, having me in the book and thank you to Biza for having us um, on this round table. So I think that my the chapter that I wrote for the book is quite peculiar in the book because I don't actually talk about the research that I've, I've done. And uh, the reason for this is that the research project that I write about had what I call a foreign team and a national team. And then in kind of trying to uh, look into the dynamics between different understandings of the research pro process, we, we thought it was useful for someone to come in kind of from the outside who was not even part of the um, national team or the foreign team to, to speak to everyone involved um, and see how, how, we, how the research process unfolded. So I hope that was kind of productive in the chapter. And the project that I write about is called Raising Silent Voices harnessing local conflict knowledge uh, for community protection from violence in Myanmar. And it was actually led uh, by uh, three kind of um, international researchers, Rachel Julian, Ellen Fernari, and Berit, who is here. So uh, in a way, if you have any kind of specific questions, there is also Berit, who was a part of the foreign team that she can answer. But, uh, but basically the project started with, um, with these uh, basically restrictions that we have in accessing uh, particular community held knowledges in, in conflict and post-conflict situations. So they worked with basically two kind of questions. First is that the local experiences, um, and here I mean really community experiences, they hold some kind of uh, specific and, and important knowledge for the way that we understand conflict. But then in, in conflict and post-conflict context, accessing that knowledge is really difficult. First, practically because of travel bans and travel restrictions. 
and because of funding and um, and time time restrictions as well. So the way that this unfolded in the project is that then the foreign team uh, uh, basically assembled a national team, not from uh, from researchers, not from trained social scientists but from three people who were involved in different ways um, in, in civil society uh, in Myanmar. And they, then they went on um, and held particular workshops in two states um, in Myanmar around a method call, uh, which is what's called me method for centered drawings. So then it wasn't really the foreign team who went and held the workshop, but it was actually these, um, these local researchers. And the interesting thing, and I think this is where really the kind of the interesting dynamics come out, is that I think it's much more simple to kind of have this kind of collaboration if the method itself is very, is very um, kind of easily defined and implemented. Like if you have a survey or if there is a former interview, a structured interview, which, which can, in which the researchers can go through questions, produce transcripts. But the, but the particular strength, I think, and the innovation in this project was that it was, in, it was underlined by very interpretivist uh, epistemologies and very kind of feminist um, sensibilities in that what the researchers wanted was really to come in and have this very open-ended process in which the, what we need to know is not clearly defined from the beginning, but emerges from the field, and in this case emerges from these drawings. And now the problem became then not how to just collaborate, but how to uh, do this kind of interpretation by proxy. And this, I think, comes from the basic idea that in interpretivist research, the researchers, uh, the research is, is central through concepts like reflexivity, but also through the way that the research design unfolds. It is basically the subjectivity of the research that influences the process very much. And then how to do this across team. Uh, uh, is the topic um, of the chapter, and now I think I think the I interviewed everyone in the in the in the team, and I think many interesting things came out. But I'm gonna just uh, bring out a few. So a few practical issues came out. For so, for example, when when the project was applying for the grant that uh, that funded the project, this this local team was not assembled yet, so they were not listed as researchers in the original grant application. So they weren't covered by, for example, ethics or security forms. But then they were also not just participants. So they were also not covered by the ethics form for the participants. So there is kind of a very practical institutional framework that needs to adapt to this kind of collaborative research. And then from then on, there were also kind of many uh, practical um, questions to negotiate during the research process. So I think one of the one of the examples that is quite um, quite straightforward and that uh, that is in the chapter is uh, in one of the workshops. One of the question was, uh, and the and the workshop was in the in the Kachin state. So one of the question was, as imagined by the foreign team, you know, how does uh, how does being Kachin make you feel? Which is kind of a classical interpretivist open ended question in which uh, the participants are invited to kind of think broadly. But then the way that the that the local team interpreted it and then actually asked it in the workshop is what what about being Kachin makes you proud, which kind of for someone coming in with an interpretivist epistemology is quite a closed way of asking a question and really not what what was meant uh, in the research design. And kind of these things were then negotiated, not in person, but through WhatsApp and Facebook messages and emails and Skype calls. And this is the kind of collaboration complexity that emerged. But what was really interesting for me in uh, interviewing uh, the foreign team and the local team was that the, the strength of the project was actually also what made it so complicated. And the strength of the project was really it's kind of open ended uh, design and really giving ownership um, to the local team to decide what is important and to decide what matters. Now that kind, I think everyone who is kind of aware of the hierarchies in knowledge production and the dangers of coming in with Eurocentric and limited concepts, I think we can all appreciate this. But then speaking to the local team, it became very clear that they actually missed some sort of structure and that they at some point really wanted, uh, as one of them said to me, that the professors should tell them what they need to know. So kind of they, they actually wanted the, the international team to come in and say like, listen, this is what we need to know and this is what you need to go out and find out. So there was really a distension between 
uh, this kind of lack of structure and as a, as a really strength of the project and the open-endedness. And then that also is creating tensions um, for the local team. Now, another thing that um, I really, that really emerged as really important was that usually the way that we understand these research collaborations in the, is in this dichotomy between national researchers and foreign researchers, and that's the relationship that we focus on. But what became clear in the interviews and what's also in the chapter is that actually the relationships within the local team were much more fraught and, much, and required a lot more relationship building and required a lot more attention. So this saying, um, you know, saying in, in the grant proposal, just like, oh, I just have a local team and then, you know, we'll work to kind of build this relationship between the local team and the international team is not enough. And there, there needs to be a much more thinking about how to actually the local team relates to each other and there needs to be space for developing this further. And I think the last thing that um, there's, I think there's a few more things in the chapter, but the last thing that um, I will mention is that the, it also involved the kind of the different people involved uh, also involved very different expectations of what research does. And I think this is a huge question, kind of what the purpose of research is. But even within the international team, there were such different understandings of what the point or what the aim of the research was. So on the one hand, of course, there are deliverables to be delivered to the grant, uh, to, to, the, to the grant funders. But then also, for example, in the local team, some of them went on to really then study research methods because they really found that this is something that they want to do. Um, another person wanted then to kind of get uh, kind of ther therapy skills in, in order to have a more kind of healing interaction with these people. Um, the international team, some people handled really well the kind of uncertainty that was around the deliverables. Other people were much more anxious about deliverables. So kind of this, what we expect, um, I think is much more complicated than simple, uh, you know, I will publish three papers and an edited volume. So I think this also needs, we need to create spaces in the research process where we can uh, discuss this. And I think this is one thing that came out from um, everyone talking, uh, everyone that I spoke to in the project is that all of these, thinking about all of these things and thinking about all of these dynamics really requires time. And this, I um, mean, collaboration, even if it's uh, in no matter what way, it um, depends on relationship building. And I think something that has been happening with kind of the, the, for the increasing neoliberalization of research funding and our, and of our projects, we have less and less time to really pay attention to this uh, relationship building that can, that can also be quite culturally uh, specific, right? So how we build relationships in the UK might be very different to how, how much time relationships building need in other parts of the world. So this is one time came out as really crucial for accommodating all of these things. And now I'm going to close with kind of two Two like interventions, I think, where um, where that I that where I think that this project also contributes, but also changes the way that we think about particular literatures. So on the one hand, the project responded to the idea of kind of bunkerization of not just uh, intervention practitioners, but also intervention scholarship. I think the the stricter the security clearances are in universities, the less uh, opportunities we will have to travel, and I think that will encourage more kind of this co collaboration. But I, but then I think also speaking about this when we're not allowed to go five kilometers from our houses in Wales, um, I think we're going to have to think about these kind of collaborations even more and to build these relationships even more. So I think in a way, the chapter really speaks to the to the current to the current. Um, moment. And then the other literature that I think uh, the chapters really spoke to and changes how we think is this kind of the, the idea of involving local or national researchers um, in, in research projects, which I think um, is not as simple probably as, as we might imagine. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Katarina. Um, I also can say it's a quite an awkward uh, uh, situation to be researched and I recommend it to everyone because it's quite humbling and you feel awkward and you know what your participants feel like when you do your research. 
Um, so thank you for that. Um, just to say before I hand over to um, first Kasha and then Catherine, um, we haven't got a speaker on the sex and sensitivity theme in the book. That book looks at research specifically like with specifically vulnerable or marginalized populations. And the reason is just because the speakers here were the ones who were supposed to be able to come to Newcastle um, to be there in person, not because we didn't want this represented. There might be speakers among the participants here or authors among the participants. And really, I um, would like to encourage you to um, uh, make a contribution then when we go on to, the, to opening the floor. But first, over to Kasha, please. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for those really honest um, presentations so far. Inevitably, in my short intervention, I will be bringing together some of those points um, you've already made. And a short disclaimer, I will be commenting on the book mainly from the perspective of international relations discipline. This is mainly because I'm more familiar with this literature than, say, literature on field work produced by um, social anthropology. And I also see the book as an excellent resource to discuss field work with my colleagues and with my students. Um, and I have one observation and three points for discussion that I'd like to share. And let's start with the observation. So I see the book as pertaining to this relatively new genre of reflexive writing in international relations. Um, and as has often been, been the case, IR is a latecomer to this reflexivity debate. It has been drawing heavily on other disciplines such as sociology and building and so on uh, discussion. Um, this book, however, is a different type of reflexive writing. Um, this is because it challenges IR scholars to do two things. First, to be honest about knowledge production practices and about failures. And second, it challenges us to embrace field work, but not as just another unproblematic method of gathering data. Rather, I think the key contribution of field work is in how reflexive we become through a sort of critical clinical engagement with this practice. And as such, the authors are not afraid to be honest about the messiness of fieldwork, confusion, failure, um, and the sort of piling ethical dilemmas one's face, one faces when embar embarking on this type of research. The authors also admit that it is difficult to speak about and embrace failure in academia. Um, which has turned uh, into a competitive marketplace with less and less time uh, for, for reflection, really. Um, and now let me propose three broad points for discussion. Um, and those will be about experiential knowledge, about participation and about ethics. So let me describe those in some detail. First, the concept of experiential knowledge. Um, it doesn't really feature explicitly in the book. Um, however, the editors emphasize, for instance, the contrast between the comfort of constructing theoretical positions with the hard earned experiences in the field. Uh, and if we define experiential knowledge as one that is based on the personal experience with a phenomenon, I think I'd like to push the authors to say a bit more about the process through which their personal experience acquires the status of knowledge. Um, and as such, it is presented in, in the handbook. Um, perhaps they could do this in relation to both their experience of, specific research, of a specific research method, but also their experience of politics, politics in a given location. So in other words, how do we move from experience to knowledge? The second point is about participation. Uh, some authors, and I'm not saying that these are the presenters, but some authors do speak about participatory observation as a method. And I have my own reflections about the limits of this method, but I would like to ask the authors to what extent can we claim that we truly participate? Do we need to share the goals and normative positions with our research participants? Do we need to be subject to the same type of political and economic pressure uh, to claim that we actually really participate? And finally, ethics or ethical dilemmas. Um, the volume's introduction asks us to consider that in difficult contexts, we need to be careful as to which observations um, and findings can be written about and how. Um, and I'd like to ask how the authors have managed this challenge. Uh, so self-censorship is, is a strong word, but uh, perhaps they could share how their experience of how to navigate the boundary between what can be written and what may be too dangerous for researcher or their participants and partners. 
Thank you so much. Great, many thanks. Um, then we have our last speaker, Catherine. If you could share your observations, please. Thanks. Um, so yeah, um, I found this book highly readable and super engaging. Um, as the speakers have shown, uh, it contains a, a wide variety of frank discussions about challenging situations during field work, and I wish it had been around when I was a PhD student. Um, reading the book um, yesterday made me reflect on my own experiences in the field, and my comments I think are just going to be a really uh, a kind of reaction to, 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 to that, that process of reading through the book. Um, so yeah, uh, a big thank you to, uh, to all the participants for writing so honestly and openly about their challenges and their failures. It's so refreshing. And uh, when we see research published and you know, narratives polished, it erases this difficult and messy process of data collection uh, and the necessarily reflexive and transformative process that goes on between the researcher and the researcher's materials. Um, not only does this, uh, does being open about this process give us, give courage to early career researchers about to enter the field for the first time, but it also helps us understand the contingent and situated way in which our knowledge about the international is created. And it shows us uh, that knowledge is never really closed, but always open and uh, ongoing and subject to challenge. Um, there were many parts of the book that resonated with me. Um, but I am particularly enjoyed uh, Marcus Goranson's story. He wasn't one of the presenters, but I just want to mention uh, his story of the interview with Rustam, a taxi driver in Dushanbe, Tajikistan. Uh, Goranson had dutifully followed the training given in his university's methods class, formally obtaining consent and recording the interview, and not only to find that this alienated and unsettled his respondent, making him uncomfortable and uh, unresponsive. Um, I also appreciated how Marcus acknowledged uh, the length of time it took for him to actually change to a more subtle and less formal tactic uh, of conducting his interviews. After all, the university methods training and stipulations of ethics committees must be right, right? This happened to me so many times during my PhD research. Uh, and it took me a whole three month field trip to realize that formally obtaining written consent was actually giving me more problems than it solved. Um, so that story, and as well as several others in the book, uh, led me to sort of pick out two of the major themes uh, in the book, which I think are particularly important. Firstly, uh, the failure in inverted commas uh, that occurs during fieldwork, and then what it means uh, to do ethical uh, research. Um, so just to quickly brief pick up on this idea of what happens when fieldwork doesn't go to plan, um, the book shows how the lack of control in the fieldwork process means that the project we propose and often win funding for may not actually be completed. Uh, this is something that's happening to me at the moment. Uh, rather, you may end up with a different project, uh, which may be equally, probably actually better than the original one. But one of the things that we have to learn when doing field work is to always have an open mind about the direction our project will ultimately take. Uh, and I think this is something that's rarely discussed formally, but it's very important. And I, I hope that uh, this book will contribute towards more openly discussing uh, this, this issue. And then finally, ethics committees are, and procedures. I just want to pick up a bit on what John said uh, earlier. So yeah, what many of the contributions suggest is that this current centralized university ethics procedure uh, don't actually uh, adequately understand the nature of the risks encountered during field work. And the mechanisms that are put in place often seem designed to protect the university from litigation rather than uh, the researcher from harm. Uh, to give an example, it once took me over a year and a half to get ethics clearance for a frankly very unrisky project of interviewing Chinese academics on Chinese university campuses, where I actually worked myself for two years. So just to just to summarize, I really hope that this uh, book will contribute to a larger discussion about the challenging and messy and contingent processes that occur behind the polished polish narratives that we read in books and journals and about how we can transform our ethics procedures inside universities. So yeah, thanks to all the uh, contributors for a refreshing, insightful and inspiring read. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Catherine, for, um, for sharing with us how, how some of the chapters resonated with you. I guess that's the, that's the case for many of the people who are on this uh, Zoom call. So I don't want to go back to the uh, speakers now. We have about, let me see, what time is it? We have about 25 minutes left um, to open the floor. And I would like to see whether there are any questions from the floor. So if you go onto the participants link at the bottom of your screen, 
you pull it up, you have the list of participants. Oh, I see already one hand. And then there's a, there's a little um, um, icon, a blue kind of hand there that says raise hand. So if you would like to ask a question, if you could leave, just raise your hand and then I'll, I'll see whether um, I see you and um, I'll collect a few questions now. So if our speakers could just make some notes. Uh, let's start with uh, Giulia Piccolino, please. Giulia. Uh, yes, I think I've become very quick in interesting my hand because yesterday I was also attending one of the roundtables organized by Visa, so I practice. <laughs> so I have actually um, one question for uh, John and uh, uh, to some extent also Catherine, and then like a comment that comes from my experience doing research into very different uh, contexts. So my, my question is that, like, we researchers have had the conversation about the fact that procedural ethics and risk assessment are inadequate uh, many, many times. And we would like, I think, uh, sympathize very much with the vocational approach that uh, John has uh, illustrated. But how do we, like, actually, like, change things? I mean, can we bring this to the senior management of universities in some way? Can we make them understand? I mean, I, I had like all sort of experiences, especially since moving in the UK, I had research that was relatively low risk that uh, encountered a lot of problems and much more risky research that was approved this year. And it seems like a constant uh, problem. And so the second thing, I mean, is a little bit like reconnects with Daniela's intervention and in general the problem of like it's asymmetric and sometimes uh, um, uh, sometimes exploitative relationship with uh, uh, local researchers and research participants. I've done research for many years in Ivory Coast and I had this problem a lot, like for instance, I would have liked uh, a local research assistants to be more involved in authorship, uh, but they had no time. Uh, um, they were running, uh, um, they were like giving more time to consultancies, for instance, because that's what brings money for them. Uh, and also with the participants, it was very difficult sometimes to maintain any contact because these are people who live in rural areas, often don't have access to the internet and so on and so forth. And then a couple of years ago, I got involved in a project in Colombia and it's a really different context because like our partners, uh, um, even if they're, uh, they have all their problems, but they have secure jobs. Um, they have relatively like enough time to do research, and they have been really been able to build a long-term relationship with the communities uh, we are researching, and also organize things like uh, trainings that give them official diplomas, uh, which the participants like very much. So what I want to say is that sometimes like it's it's also like the local context that is not like within our possibility to change that that in some cases like is conducive to a type of research that is less exploitative and uh, um, more supportive of the participants and in some cases is not. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have Jesse Driscoll um, next, and Jesse is also one of the authors in the book who actually uses, uh, interestingly, game theory to make sense of his research experience. Jesse. Hi. Um, well, first, I, I, I logged on mostly so that I could actually see my co-authors and the editors and thank them uh, for the opportunity to participate in the volume. Um, it, it was a wonderful invitation. I, I think the... Um, I, I don't know. I don't think that, that Jamie is on the call today, but um, um, Cassia is completely right that in IR, um, we're kind of late to the conversation about reflexivity and knowledge. And I would say that the North American Academy is, is doubly late to it. And so it's just, a um, you know, the conversation in the United States in terms of graduate training is much more focused on questions of how you can produce a pipeline of, 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 of 15 papers um, in order to get your career started. 
And that's just a very different conversation. It's initiated on a very different set of grounds than the conversation that um, is taking place in this volume. And I, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be invited and do both. So I don't imagine that anybody wants to read game theory very much. It was just kind of, you know, my opportunity to, um, to speak from position um, if you want to, if you want to think about positionality in that way. Um, I wanted to respond directly to something that Cassia said, and thank you both Cassia and Catherine for your thoughtful comments on the book. I, 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 um, I, I wanted to just confess that the question, the way you phrased it, Cassia, for me personally, um, has mostly led to um, self-censorship and a decision to actually not work um, anymore in um, certain parts of the world, is that I think that the problems are sufficiently serious that as I have gotten older and um, become a parent, uh, I, I simply can't take risks, um, not only with my own safety, but with the safety of my research assistants. And I think that it's important to just acknowledge that up front is that it's useful to have these conversations um, in a straightforward way with graduate students and say, yeah, so the choices that I made at age 25, I, I can barely repeat, you know, out loud um, as a 38 year old, because I look back on, on what I did and I think about how dangerous it actually was. And, you know, the actual response is like, well, um, kids are going to do what kids are going to do. <laughs> um, but but uh, I, I, I think that this opportunity for like honest reflection is really important. And I think that it's also important to just state very clearly that the actual answer sometimes is that you just switch topics and switch field sites because you can't do work safely. Um, and rather than let that kind of linger um, as, a, as an unstated, um, uh, gloss, I wanted to just say it explicitly, but, you know, thank you very much for, for the thoughtful read. Yeah, thank, thanks, for, uh, thanks for that. I should just say, Jesse has done research in, uh, in Central Asia and also in, South, in the South Caucasus, and it is a very interesting chapter. I never thought I would like uh, to read something about chicken, a game of chicken and field work, but I was, um, I thought, I think there's a lot of, 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 of stuff in there um, that, that you need to think about. So I would really recommend reading it as well. I have Kathleen Jennings uh, now with a blue hand up. And Kathleen is also one of the authors and she's actually in that part that we left out, the one we called Sex and Sensitivity. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for organizing this round table. I'm so delighted that it's digital so I get to, um, to participate after all. Um, I just wanted to, since Barrett brought up the, the section, I just wanted to chime in a little bit about uh, that and echoing really a lot of what other people have already said. Um, and I must admit, I missed some of the comments because we've had kids trooping in and out of the house. So <laughs> I haven't quite uh, been able to focus the whole time. But um, because I mean, what I ended up taking up in in my chapter had to do also a lot with this idea of the contingency of knowledge production where, and my chapter really is talking about um, uh, marginalized and vulnerable sources. And the title is um, sex workers and sugar babies. And it's based on field work that I did before and also for my PhD in peacekeeping sites in um, the DRC, Liberia and Haiti. Um, and um, because, I mean, what, what I have learned from the fieldwork I've done is that, you know, you can't have, you can't have a perfect plan. Things are going to go wrong. And even if your plan itself doesn't go wrong, people will react to you in ways that you cannot predict. And you will also react to people in ways that you cannot predict. And that is something that it took me a long time to kind of accept because I think I had this idea in my head that I have to get X number of interviews, or I have to get, you know, I really have to get this interview proper because I need this in order to build that blah, blah, blah. And um, it took me a really long time to figure out that, you know, um, no one has perfect field work. And just because my field work hasn't gone or field work haven't gone the way I necessarily thought they would, doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of really good uh, material that I can build on. And it's, and you learn stuff from when things go wrong. And, and no, that wasn't exactly what I thought was going to happen, but okay, what have I learned from that? Where does that take me? Um, and so for me, I mean, I think that one of the 
things that I pick up on in my chapter is that it's important to be as prepared as you can, but it's also important to be able to kind of wing it when you need to. And for me, that winging it often involved showing up on people's doorsteps unannounced and knocking on their door and asking if I, or, you know, be it an office door or be it um, a brothel um, and asking if I could talk to people. Um, and that doesn't always work, but sometimes it does work. Um, and some of my best interviews actually kind of came that way. I'm reasonably certain that wouldn't be in the guidelines for your research ethics board, but that's how it worked for me. Um, and then I also really stress this notion of critical empathy towards our sources where, I mean, I think it's really important to, um, of course, we need to empathize. I mean, I come from a feminist higher tradition and, you know, reflexivity and empathy is obviously sort of the backbone of that and positionality and sort of interrogating ourselves and our power and our relation to those around us. So that is really kind of baked into the that tradition. But I think it's also important to, um, I mean, you're, you're still a researcher. And for me, interviewing um, people who were in quite marginal or marginalized or potentially vulnerable positions, I mean, of course, it's important to try to establish as good a connection with them as you can. It's, of course, important to listen and to take their stories, but it doesn't mean you have to also take everything at face value. And that's something that I've also learned is that you're not doing your job as a researcher if you kind of blindly believe everything that you're told. Um, because people sometimes do have an agenda and they do have stories that they want to get out or they aren't necessarily, it's, some people are you know, lying to you for whatever reason. That actually I found to be rare, but you get other situations where, I mean like with sex workers, where when I was interviewing after I interviewed enough sex workers, you start to kind of get a sense of like, okay, this person isn't lying, but they're exaggerating. So like one typical way that would play out would be when I would ask them how much they charge. And if I heard a number that was really weird, I would be like, okay, that, that's, that's interesting. Do you often get that much money? And then you kind of, so, and that again shows also the importance of preparation to be able to go into a dialogue also with people so that you are talking to each other as, so that it is a dialogue and that's not just sort of the, the sort of extracting the researcher as knowledge extractor, as a sort of extractive um, device. And then the, the source or the person being interviewed as kind of this, you know, um, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to, what I was trying to get at was that, you know, even when you have people in situations where you would consider them to be vulnerable, um, it's important to also treat them, be respectful enough to also, you know, to listen to what they're saying, but to also, if not necessarily confront them, but if you hear, if you're hearing things that you think sound a little bit strange, you have to keep that filter on because you're not doing yourself or your research or them any good by kind of removing your critical lenses. Um, so that's something that I also took up in the piece. Um, but no, I'm, I'm really, I haven't read all the pieces yet in the, or all the chapters yet, but I'm very excited to read it. And I'm very thankful that I got to be on the call today. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. I have one um, last hand up here, that's Anna Maria Kiss, and then I would like to give back to, uh, go back to the, the, the original speakers uh, for them to respond. Anna Maria. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, since we mostly don't know each other, um, I know somebody virtually, somebody not at all. Um, I'm at King's College London. I'm a first year PhD student. And uh, sorry for the drilling if you hear it, neighbours are only waiting. Um, I just uh, want to say how thankful I am for, for being um, in this conversation, um, mainly because, believe it or not, the university, um, with the British understatement, offering uh, quite a little on um, how fieldwork is actually done and what are the risks and uh, how we as researchers uh, might uh, feel about certain things. And um, uh, these kind of conversations are very timely and need to go on, especially that I agree that um, how I see there is a, a lot of uh, research coupled in what is going on. Um, um, so um, this is very good and uh, let me say that for me, probably the first reading that helped to understand how it looks like it was Jess Driscoll's book on warlords. So um, um, I think the, 
the honesty he writes about his experience in Tajikistan um, and Georgia is, is just amazing. And um, because I'm also in a post-Soviet um, um, uh, field and space um, doing um, Russian foreign fighters. So um, that's really helpful. And I was, uh, and I probably will keep wondering, probably no answer to a question of um, what Kathleen just said, uh, of, of how to be prepared for something you can't predict, right? So um, I'm trying constantly to prepare myself for this a uh, thing that is unpredictable that will go wrong. So I think if we continue this discussion and keep it open and involve also as many PhD students as possible, that will help us greatly. And thank you very much again for this conversation. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Um, super. So I would like to um, give the, the authors who have spoken in the beginning the opportunity now to come back to whatever they would like to come back to. Maybe it is the best we just go in the order of, of the speakers. Maybe, John, if you would like to start, you're still there. John? Sure, if, if Morton doesn't, doesn't want oh, to. Oh, sorry. So you didn't start. That's true. Morton. <laughs> See, that's my confusion. Martin, if you would like to start. Sorry about that. Thank you for saving me. I mean, you try to ignore me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to it. Uh, that's how it is to work with Bedit. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for, uh, both to presenters and people who commented and people who commented from the forum. I mean, uh, I think this has been a very good conversation. Um, I think I just want to pick up on two points here. I mean, one is this about ethics and what we can write about and what we cannot write about, because that's an important topic. Uh, for me, it has always been, and this also talks to this about what K Kathleen talks about, uh, about critical empathy. <coughs> we are researchers. We are not, we should not take on the role, in my point of view, as activists, nor should we sort of think of ourselves as investigators. People that are sort of naming, shaming, and blaming should not be our game. That may in many time, in many places, and in many cases, be an important line of work, but it shouldn't be ours, because we should be careful not to mix roles there. And my personal take on this is that I can write about people and mention people, but it should be people who already are in some sort of limelight. I would never sort of make a reference to somebody who isn't already known to be doing certain things. So when I work in uh, Mali and the Sahel, well, Mali is quite uh, easy in that regard because the level of impunity is so immensely high so that, I mean, uh, people really don't care whether you mention them or, or not because at least if you are on the government side, I mean, it will, uh, it will never have any consequences for, uh, for them. And people are almost brag about this. But um, that's my line here, that when it comes to people, they shouldn't, should have incriminated themselves before I make a reference to them. So this means that in certain cases, I mean, I've been, uh, I have been sitting on and still sits on uh, material that uh, probably could have been very helpful with regard to getting an article published because I would have then have been the, the first who could say something about whatever happened back then in Kidal, for example, or uh, some other uh, example. I have deliberately chosen not to use that material. And I think that is something that we need to keep in mind that no matter what we think about our research subjects, we have a responsibility of protecting our informants, no matter what we think about them. Because we have a, our position is the role of researchers. We, are, we shouldn't confuse that with activism. And this is not to say anything wrong about activism. It's just that there has to be some line set between what you do as a researcher and what you do as a social activist, what you do as a journalist, what you do as a detective, and what you do as a researcher. And we need to be careful not mixing those lines. So that would be my take on this, that we need to have a strong ethical code of conduct. And that strong ethical code of conduct needs to apply to all of informants and all of research subjects, 
no matter what we think about them and what we think they have done and so on and so forth. So the, the same kind of the code of conduct needs to apply both to people we think are worthy victims and people we think are uh, maybe basically dirty bastards, to put it that way. Because there the cannot be... Sorry, second yeah, point then second, quickly, because we're running second, out of time. Second point on, on co-publishing. I do think that, I mean, as much as I agree with uh, Julia on, on the difficulty of this, I think that all of us can do more in that regard. And you should uh, sort of think very cre creatively about how we could do more with regard to co-publishing. And at least that goes for those of us, again, who are more established, who work on larger project grants. I think it's, I see a lot of this where people come in on relatively large project grants and basically use people as data collectors, people they work with in the field. And then they go back and write long uh, articles about uh, positionality and intersectionality and, and uh, emancipa emancipation and so on, but I see very little of that in the field. There needs to be a stronger connection in the whole research environment between practice and what we actually write about these things. Thank you. Super, many thanks. John. Hi, thanks. I'll try and be quick, uh, although so many great points. I just want to respond, first of all, to Katerina's mention about you know, team building within a national context. In our case, we had um, three national contexts of intervention and three places which were countries that might do intervening. And we had researchers, one person at least, in each of those contexts. Um, so we got the team together uh, at the beginning and at the end. Uh, there were tensions at both times, you know, beneath the surface. Um, and there were lots of dyadic relationships as well. But you're absolutely right about that. And it's extremely difficult and um, expensive. And, uh, but, you know, maybe in the Zoom era, there's much more we can do in terms of, of team building. So that's a really good point. Uh, Cassius points that whole question about experiential knowledge and how do we get to knowledge about the kind of things we're talking about here. I thought it was a really great one. I mean, just to say something briefly for me, our experience was traumatic in many ways, less so for me than one or two other people, but it was still traumatic for me. And, um, you know, there was a, I wrote a personal essay as soon as possible afterwards trying to process that. Um, I think part of these did something very similar. We used that as source material for this chapter, but it also went through a whole series, many, many public and private discussions of processing and making sense of that and placing it within the wider context of, of field work and my knowledge of that particular field and our knowledge and others' challenges and all those different things. And then you get to the output. So that was my personal personal knowledge typically. Which, um, and then also your points about, about, about ethics, which um, yeah, the whole question of that Morton just spoke to of, of which findings and self-censorship. And I'd agree with Jesse, uh, there's certain things we just don't work on. And Tajikistan is as kleptocratic and violent now as a government as it was in 2014, but we write on it probably even less. And we didn't write on it that much then. Um, and that's just the reality. There, are, I think we're not investigat investigators, as Morton says, we're not activists, but uh, some of that can be subject to academic analysis. I've tried to do it in different ways, looking at the offshore financial aspects, something you can do without doing field work. But it does mean you tend to do more of it without collaboration and participation with, with Tajik nationals. And so that there's a trade off there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, self censorship absolutely happens. There's loads of data I got I don't, that I don't publish. Um, and I think the point Morton mentioned also about uh, you write about the incriminator, not so much those certainly don't making public. Others and other positions also an important one. Kat's point about um, the barriers that ethics committees place is also really important. I've seen loads of examples of that. One of the problems is ethics committees, the way they use these formulaic systems of travel advisories and the like, completely unable to diagnose what constitutes a risk and what doesn't. So risk is very situated, subjective. It matters who you are, your citizenship, your background. You know, so a, a general British Foreign Office travel advisory that says British citizens must not go to doesn't help you if you are from, I don't know, Turkey and you're a certain gender or sexuality, you're going to a certain place. And it's, you know, it just, and actually very often they identify things that would be risks, um, 
which aren't risk for that person, but are other things it won't identify that could be risk for that person. So very blunt instruments. And that take, takes me on to Julia's question about change. How do you change the ethics committee? I mean, I think there is a role for engagement. Uh, at Exeter, I've engaged. Um, I've mentioned a couple of things. Um, we had a review of all research related to defense, security and conflict. One of the recommendations that's now finally being established is that we have a kind of a committee of peers who are the go-to people when there are issues, you know, people who have experience of field work, experience in this area, different area studies. So one of the big problems is a college ethics committee doesn't know what to do with some of these applications. They're sitting on them. They're totally petrified and they need to better refer to someone who can at least give a little bit of a steer. And so we, we, we're trying to set something like that up. Um, there's more I could say on that, but um, I think training is really important as well. Um, I do the political ethnography talk for PhD students taking research methods. So we talk about field work there, but that, that's it. And it, it's, you know, a one, two hour seminar, it's really not enough. Um, more needs to be done on training. But all of this, I think it's just really important to make sure that whilst we say, yeah, it's for us to decide and work out ways of doing this and support one another, but the institutions have to take responsibility too. If we, if we, if we absolve them a responsibility by saying it's all for us to manage and mediate ourselves, we can lose, I think, some of the support that they can offer. And we needed that support in our circumstance. So it was, it was important. Oh, sorry, I've gone on too long. I will. Um... Yeah, we are, we are running a couple of minutes over, but I hope everybody's fine with that. Over to Daniela, please. Yes, thank you. I'm not sure what to answer now, but I think maybe I'll say just two things. So one is about Kasia's question on um, on knowledge and how our experiential, our personal experience becomes knowledge, which I think is so important and is so central to field work. Um, and the way I thought about, I mean, I think about this in my research is that this idea of intervention is, is again, uh, also a, a kind of a methodological issue that you uh, you disturb the context of the research when you are there, when you when you intervene into it. Um, and then this disturbance produces effects that you analyze. And this is not only in what is, makes field work, well, field work is that you, it's not just about, you know, going into an interview and um, and producing data in the more recognizable form, but also uh, all the, the the kind of rever reverberations of that uh, in the relations you create in the field, and uh, by analyzing through the you know, of, uh, what kind of relation structure those experiences, then you produce knowledge, or this is kind of the first step in producing this knowledge. But the reverberations around the research interactions are just as important, at least in this approach to research, I think. Uh, I'm not sure that really answers your question, but I thought it was really, really important one. Um, and the second thing was about this issue of co-publishing, which, I mean, I haven't uh, really had a re a re local collaborators for research, but I think it's the, what made me wonder is also that we need maybe to discuss a little bit more explicitly the nature of academic publishing and the limitations that that poses to also writing together, because it's not a given that, for example, local researchers uh, can, I don't know, want to write in English uh, or want to publish in an academic format that this is the, the, the universally kind of regarded as the highest form of publication. Uh, and, and academic publishers, publishing poses a lot of, kind of obstacles and hoops we need to jump through to get published. Uh, and that maybe we need to be also more creative in the, uh, in the outputs, in the writing, even written outputs that we produce um, and not limit this to just uh, um, publishing, co-writing academic uh, publications, um, which would also address the problem of accessibility of research findings that are mostly published in English. And that it's something that I'm certainly uh, try to kind of grapple with in, uh, in my work that a lot of the things I write about uh, those communities in Bosnia are not um, really accessible to them also because they're um, they're uh, they're written in English. They're written in acad uh, in academic uh, format that is not accessible openly. So so yeah, I think this is something else that we probably need to discuss more and think about more. 
Thank you very much, Daniela. And then the last word goes to Katarina. Hi, thank you so much. I have so much to say, but I'll try to keep it really short. Uh, so first, on this idea of how to change things, and I think here I would really second John to say that I don't think that doing away with institutional frameworks is the way to go, not even that that would be like a realistic option. Because I think when you talk about these over-researched uh, contexts, like Daniela talks about, you need institutional oversight, like having it free for all. I mean, I trust in our ability to be reflective about our practices, but it's just not enough. So I would be more for kind of trying to influence the way that these institutional frameworks are shaped and implemented. And I think for this, like one is to shape the actual institutional frameworks. And here, you know, it's not just about talking to senior management, but maybe at some point, some people in their careers become senior management and they can kind of influence it. But it's also about um, publishing on these things. So I know for a about a couple of initiatives that are trying to publish on the process uh, of this. And I think this is crucial to kind of push this into the uh, realm of public debate so that it can then feed into the additional frameworks, which I know is kind of a reformist long-term view, but I think that for me, that's kind of the best uh, chance that I see. And I want to just um, uh, go to two points of experiential knowledge. And I think in the chapter that I wrote, you can see really how everyone's experiences influenced what they focused on in the research project. But also what is cool, what is so cool about the project that uh, the chapter is about is that experiential knowledge is not only about our experiential knowledge. It is about also about developing innovative tools for accessing different people's experiential knowledge and in the in the project that was done through drawing. So I think it's also kind of I would just also like to invite us to think about this kind of new new tools with which you can experiment with accessing this experiential knowledge. And lastly, and this kind of ties in this experiential knowledge with Katya's comment on participant observation. And here, I'm sorry, I'm going beyond what I wrote in the book, but it's a question that I think about a lot, so I can't help myself. And I'm a bit wary about uh, of this valorization of experiential knowledge when it comes from, you know, ethnography, participant observation, fieldwork in general. And in my case, it also often relates to the fact that I researched the region that I come from. So it's always kind of, you know, because you're from there. And I think that this kind of understanding of what the benefit of fieldwork is and what, what ways of knowing we have is deeply problematic, both epistemologically and politically because I think it limits how we understand the difference. It implies this that we can become one with our research subjects and then really know and have this unmediated access to reality, which I think is deeply, deeply fraught. First, epistemologically, because I think we know, I mean, at least in, uh, from an interpretivist kind of um, sensibility, you know that there is no unmediated access. But secondly, I think it's also quite a colonial and extractive way of approaching difference. It's this like either becoming one or othering even more. And I think we need to kind of move away from that. I think it's difficult because we see so much benefit in doing fieldwork and ethnography and discussing this. But I think we also must be very, very careful to not valorize it in this kind of, in it becoming this epistemic privilege that is just not there and quite dangerous. But thank you very much for such an excellent session, everyone. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you for these comments. So yeah, for me, uh, what remains for me to be done is just thank everyone, thank our speakers, our discussants, everyone who uh, came in from the floor, and thank you everyone for uh, for joining us here for this session. I hope, or uh, I would say Martin and I probably hope that this is just the start of discussions. I think we raised some really interesting topics and there's so much more to be talked about. And as the book claims, these are kind of, there will be no definite answer to every question we raise, but we need to discuss what the different ways of going about um, answering these questions might be. So I hope to see you all uh, again soon somewhere else uh, and to continue this important discussion about field work. Um, stay safe, everyone, and thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>